that time, Chang and Everton um, built 50 houses down in Kaula for the victims. And he also built a football pitch for one of the schools so that the children, those who are really lost over the members of the family, can have something to look forward to as playing football. And since then, Chang and Everton have been going back uh, every two years to visit them. And, and this time, again, this is a, a program from Everton, if, if, if from them, not from, even from us, is they have a program called the Act of Kindness. Um, and we very, very touched um, that Everton have initiated this and sent two of their legends all the way um, from uh, Everton in Goodison Park to share this. But also more important is that we actually, for the last two days, we were down in Phuket. Um, first, we went to um, the school. We did a, a, a clinic for all the 300 boys uh, from all the schools around the region, the area. Uh, and then we went to the villages and, we, and then met some of the families and, and we gave them um, you know, some gifts and so for each other family. Um, they did the kindness and Chang is obviously very, very touched for this sort of partnership, not for commercial reason, but really um, of the heart and for the people. And this is why they are here. But of course, uh, when we're here, we'd like to share so for their presence with, with the fan club. So today, not only from British uh, Chamber of Commerce, we also have some of the, the Everton fans that are here as well, because they, they, they have their ears to the ground whenever they know there's something wrong. Uh, they were not invited in the beginning, but they said, they were not invited, it's not sure. We never say no. It's come from the heart, we never say no. Anyway, so, so this is why we are here, and uh, obviously, uh, I'd like to thank you again coming here and also I'd like to thank the the retro. This is actually called the um, you know sort of the, the liquid park. Uh, you can see that if you come before sunset, there's a beautiful view of you know Sukhumvit area of the Golden Park. So great value for function. So if you have a function in the future, please come here and we'll always give you special prizes. So this is the advertising bit. So anyway, without further ado, back to you. Great. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, just, just a quick word while the guys are, are talking to us. If you need to answer your phone or have a conversation, could you just step a few yards outside as a courtesy to, to the guys? Because I'm sure everyone else would like to listen. If you could do that, that would be fantastic. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce a legend of televised sport in Singapore, a particular part of Singapore. Uh, Mr. P.J. Roberts, he just happens to be in town at the moment. A, fa a familiar face to many. Um, Paul has uh, kindly, kindly agreed to uh, ask the lads a few questions and then we'll take a few questions from the floor. So, uh, over to you, P.J. Thank you. Greg, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. We'll get the, get the gentleman up. Give him a big round of applause. I've had a couple of guys. We'll set up here, it's a little bit easier. But yeah, thank you, Greg, for that very kind introduction. I'm Peter, I'm based in Singapore, but work with Fox Sports, so we go regionally. And I've been in Singapore now for 13 years, so. Obviously, Australia won the Asian Cup. You all appreciate that, don't you? So I'm actually Asian. And then the second aspect relating to Everton, Tim Cahill. He's Australian. A legend for Everton. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of symmetry there in relation to this. But it's uh, it's great to come to Bangkok and obviously be a part of this. So guys, we heard a little bit about what you've been up to for the last few days. Um, you know, for many people who are obviously from Asia appreciate how devastating the tsunami was for the region. Um, a lot of that coverage obviously goes overseas, but for yourselves personally, um, I guess, first of all, having seen the impact that Chang and Everton have had in the community, um, what was the experience like? Well, it was very, very humbling. Uh, obviously, we're so far away, and you see pictures on, on the television, you don't really realise the scale what actually happened 10 years ago. Uh, to go down to here, uh, it was very, very humbling. Got to meet some of the families, 
prompt to experience some of the details about how they survived. Uh, so, you know, we came away from there and thought, wow, they've been through so much. And it was important that we, we, we could try and help you know, alongside Chang and the rebuilding of some houses. So it was a very, very, very worthwhile trip and, and as I said, very humbling. I actually, uh, there was a movie came out about the tsunami and I actually went to the pictures uh, to go and watch the movie. So uh, for me to watch the movie a few years ago and then to arrive at the village, as, as Graham said, was, was quite touching. Uh, and some of the stories, you, you stood there and you listened and quite frightening as well. And uh, it did bring a tear to your eye. And uh, I just think what Chang and, and Everton have done, I think the friendship between, uh, between Chang and Everton uh, is, is absolutely fantastic for the last 10 years, incredible. But to see them pull together and help these people in this village uh, was, was, was really touching. And uh, I think to see, to see the kids down there as well, they did a soccer area as well, to see the kids down there in, in Chang and Everton shirts and just with a smile on their face. It's absolutely fantastic just to see their kids smiling. And particularly when you look at, at look at football coming from, I mean, we're all football fans, but in a number of countries, football is popular, but there's lots of other sports that are popular as well. Thailand in particular, football is, is phenomenal. Having recently won the Suzuki Cup, congratulations. <laughs> very, very impressive. Used to play against Ke after 12 years. Actually, used to play against Kiyota Suk when he was playing in Singapore many years ago. So it was great to see Thailand win the Suzuki Cup. But as, as football, as a, as a platform to, to build that community engagement, um, we see it in other countries, but it, it, as you mentioned, it's great to see Chang and Everton with that relationship. How has football, um, in particularly the food that region, made a big difference for some of the Well, it's massive. We, we had a, a coaching clinic in the same. I think we were told the numbers were 60, I would expect 60 kids here, but we went up to the facility for Kent. Uh, FC and the facility was great, but there's over 200 kids here. So it just shows you what, what a tool the football can be. Uh, you know, the, the kids were fantastic, but also some of the, the Phuket players came along and joined in as well. So football's massive, and there's so much of an influence you know, on the community. Back in Everton, we have a fantastic community. Uh, ideas, you know, we're in, uh, involved in so many different projects. We've just opened a preschool to, to help the kids who are struggling in mainstream school. So we're very, very proactive alongside the community. And football is a massive part. You know, coming down from Glasgow, living in Liverpool, for the people it's their life. You know, football, born and bred, you know, Evertonians, whether they be births, marriages, deaths, are all happened around the football club. It just shows what an impact it has. And I'm sure in Thailand and the work and uh, the do you know, it's incredible to see. I've been over before, and the interesting thing is when you do have a football play, there's how many kids in the attract from outlying areas that come in, and they're also fed and watered, and it's a fantastic experience, so it's got a massive part to play football. It is a great aspect of the, the Premier League, particularly we see, obviously, the Premier League sell their domestic and international rights for a ridiculous amount of money. 40% increase on the last cycle. So it's great to see, I think, such a long-term partnership with Chang and Everton over such a long time contributing back to the community. But looking at some of those kids, you see the little Thai superstars running around that you could poach and take back over there? There is some good players. I've seen uh, one that's such a Sharpie. Uh, Sharpie had been doing a different group, and I watched this one lad in particular, and he was 16 year old, and I thought, wow, he's, he's a bit special, this kid. And I told him, and he uh, said, you good player, and, and it, but it was great, the number of girls that were there as well, young girls playing football, it was fantastic to see, to see girls, five, six, playing football, enjoying themselves with the Everton crest on, uh, and as Graham said, Chang's involvement is it, it, absolutely fantastic, and uh, it's just been a privilege and a pleasure uh, to be over here, hopefully in June, Myself and Greg will be back out again <laughs> when I have a work with Paul, when I beat him at golf tomorrow. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll be back out again. If you do that, you won't be back. No, I have to let you pop, so hopefully we, me and Pop beat uh, Graham at, uh, at Paul tomorrow. Yeah, we had a, uh, we came over in June and we had a, a watching the, 
the, the young boys play in the, in the Chang Cup. And there was one point I think that Sean, you know, I, I had a look at him. Really, really close to, to bring him over to heaven. And it was that close. It was like a little fashion style second forward, but he was really, really close to heaven to take him on. So, so the kids are out there. You know, it's important that the, the coaching that we're giving the kids, you know, when they come out in, in the summer, helps them through. And look, I think we would love to have a, a Thai boy coming over and making an impact in, uh, in, in the Premier League. As we've talked about before, and the Premier League is massive. In, Asia, so I think if we can unearth a, a diamond, I think that we'd be, be, be laughing, you know, it would be fantastic for us. We're well, talking about the Premier League, it's so international now. It, I mean, but you guys are playing as English and you're Scottish. Lots of Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> I guess looking back then and then comparing it to now, I mean, we talk about the money that's coming from the game with the broadcast and sponsorship rights, the foreign talent that's coming to the game. How has it how has it changed, and has it changed for the better or for the worse? Yeah. I think there's some good things, and I think there's some bad things. I think some of the talent that's come in, we were just talking about it last night about the best foreign imports into the Premier League, and, and Ian mentioned too. And you know, I've seen Kyle in there. Uh, yeah, he he is, but he wasn't in the three that we mentioned. We mentioned we mentioned Dennis Bergkamp, Thierry Henry, and I said no, not the best for me. I thought Shanghai was over, was the best. So when you think of all the talent that has actually come into the Premier League, that's a good thing. You know, that's a really good thing. But I think we, we got to a stage where, with a detrimental effect to the national side, probably there was too many foreign players coming into the Premier League. But listen, it's the, the, the best league in the world at this moment in time. Uh, and I don't think there's any way we can stop it. I think some of the older supporters will look at it in time and think, they don't try as hard as they did in, in our time in the 70s and 80s and it's all about money. But no, I think it's a fantastic product and you know, I think it's safe to, to be there for long money. Yeah, it is. There's some fantastic players there. So the foreign match, Ronaldo, incredible for Man United, what he's doing for Real Madrid. But the only thing that disappoints me, I might be old fashioned, I might be. Yeah. But I, I think I've talked to a couple of lads today, Les, and, and I said, the tackling's gone out of the game and when they're not getting touched and they're going down, rolling over. That disappoints me in English football. I do a lot of commentary work for Evan TV and I find it quite frustrating and it's keeping calm when I see players that are not injured going down and the game has to stop and throw it back to the opposition or kick it back. That, that's the only thing that frustrates me about English football and foreign players, but I think they've brought a lot of good things to the game. There's some quality, quality players out there. As Graham said, and we all know, everybody is fighting for the rights for the Premier League for TV rights. There's a very good reason why it's so popular and, and so much money is coming into the game. I guess if you're to put your governance hat on and you see so much money coming into the game, and it's, it's sitting at the top of the Premier League. There's the, the big argument, the big discussion about how much it trickled down to, to grassroots level. Um, obviously, grassroots level drives success but it's a, it's a long-term proposition. If you're running the, the Premier League right now, obviously the, 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 the clubs have the power. They stick with all the money. We see you out here from Chang and contributing back to the community. Do you think there should be a much bigger focus on that? Yeah, for uh, that. You know, the, the money involved in the is, is incredible. You know, but I think they still have to get back. I think they, they still have to work in... You know, and I'm not just saying this because it's Emma. You know, the community projects are, are not the league, probably the best community projects in, in the Premier League. You know, yes, other clubs are trying to catch up with this, but I, I personally believe it should trickle down. You know, I, I don't think it's, unless everybody knows if we hate the money, we've got to keep it for. I think there's jobs lower down. We're looking at professional football that haven't been paid for three or four months, you know, and it's probably a little bust. I think a little help from the top would help. I think that's something that, you know, they've got to do. They do a lot of good work in Premier League. They do an awful lot of good work. But I still think there's more to come from them than and more should be done. And, and, and I also think uh, most footballers are from working class backgrounds. And I think to see uh, to see lads being took at five and six year old to football clubs, I think that's wrong for me. I think they should be allowed to play school football. 
Sunday league football, enjoy the football, and probably go to a professional club when they're probably 12 years old, 10 years old, not like five and six. Let them go out and play with their mates. And the grassroots football for me, the pitches and everything, the money in the Premier League, surely the Premier League put something back to communities. I, I just, I, I have my, uh, three children, three boys myself, and watch them play on a Sunday. And I think some of the pitches they're playing on and the changing facilities are an absolute disgrace. And we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of lads on 100, 200,000 pounds a week. Uh, I, I think really there should be a lot more money put into those things. I think most people would agree with you as well. Um, focusing on Everton, David Moyes. Now, he's gone through a little cycle, hasn't he? It was like a lot of success. He'd been in Everton for a long time. He went to Manchester United. Didn't do so well. They got rid of him. Brought in Martinez. Did phenomenally well his first year. Now not doing so well. Manchester United grew a little bit fun up. Spent over £150 million. Pounds. Now he's been criticised. Yeah. <laughs> David Royce. Looking back over the last two years, how, how do you both perceive, perceive him, I guess? Because he's sitting there and smoking cigars yeah. and having a great time. Well, he has to be his PR from Manchester United, but no, I thought David Moyes was fantastic for him. I know he had a lot of critics at the end. Uh, probably the way he left wasn't in a great manner. Uh, but I guess he wanted him to stay, but he had to move to Manchester United and he made that move. I don't think the senior players at Manchester United helped David Moyes. You know, without naming on the name, I think the senior players there at the time didn't take to him. You hear all these stories now because he cheese and didn't allow the chips uh, for, for dinner, all these nonsense stories. So I think he's up against it. I think he follows Alex Ferguson, Don't Go Be Half. So Don't Go Be Nibble. Probably looking at the, the mix and the match, Manchester United have used to play in a certain way. It's more attacking than probably the David had at Everton. David was a, a manager who set up well defensively and maybe scraped it up game 1 0 and set pace or whatever. He built his success on that, the relative success he had. He goes to Manchester United, he expects to play this big for football, that wasn't going to happen. He never had the players on his side. So I felt a little bit sorry for him. Uh, but I, I think he's moved to Sociedad now and uh, it's a new chapter and I think he'll be enjoying it. I mean, apart from trying to learn Spanish, which is He's not very good at uh, but Is that because he's Scottish? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, he had an interview the other day when he was talking and he tried to get towards Spanish. One of those press players. He said one of those press players and he got it wrong. But I hope he does well. He, he's a nice guy. We got to know him. Not too well, but got to know him at Everton. And uh, I'm sure he'll be back. But it's, where does he go? You know, it was last Miller. Boys were just saying, ask Miller, sat to the manager. Would he fancy that? Ask him whether or not the best seat at the moment can work with him. So it's a different one, but you know, I hope he does well. Yeah, I think we, we need David Moyes and yeah, he has had his critics at, at Everton, but uh, it's like when David left, we had a great season last season, and every, all the Evertonians were saying, that's it, we're playing a different brand of football, forget Moyes. We, now we're not having a different, we're having a little bit of different form. The yeah, Evertonians want David Moyes back. So it is quite frustrating, and uh, it must be as a manager. Supporters are around the world are the same. Arsenal fans wanted Arsenal Wenger out. Uh, they play great football, they're doing well. But they want him out. So it's, it's difficult. Uh, fans have got their opinion, and rightly so. I'm a fan now of Everton now. I'm not a player anymore, so I'll, I'll criticise Roberto's selection now and again. Personally, I'm not from out and say it because I'm working for the club, but deep down, you know, after your own job, yeah, yeah. <laughs> after myself, yeah. That's fair enough. But that's fair enough. I've got my own thoughts about, about a certain team and about the way we play. And uh, as I say, I'm just a fan. But I think Roberto's found it difficult this season. The players have not performed as well as they did last season. And I think other teams have worked it out a little bit better now because we used to have Seamus Coleman and Leighton Baines who were phenomenal fullbacks pushing on, creating chances. Now teams are looking at us and say, right, we stop Baines, we stop Coleman, and that's half the better than his attacking force. So they're working us out, and we've really struggled a little bit this season, and we, we got beaten put in last night to our last minute goal, so yeah, it's a difficult time for us. So with Martinez, I mean, great appointment initially, a little bit 
controversial, I guess. I mean, everyone liked the style of play, but one year played Kirby Wigan, but then they got relegated, so that's what cancelled each other out. Um, it did remarkably well that first year. You talked about them sort of being understood this year. So Martinez is sitting there in his position with good talent. Like, you look at his squad, McCarthy, you can question whether he was better. He was better on loan, as most players are, because they're fighting for a club. But how, how do they need to change their style of play? Um, you know, to, to maybe bring it back. Because but you mentioned with the David Moyes, he could grind out a one year result. It wasn't the prettiest, but it's about winning in the premiership. You can play clean boy in football, but if you're not winning, no one cares. It does for Lambert by now. So if you're Martinez, how are you going to go about it for the next few months just to make sure that you're finished in a respectable position and the fans have got a reasonable smile on their face? Yeah, well, I think in the last couple of games, against Liverpool, they changed it. They played three, three open midfield players. So I think they were better defensively. I've always thought this season, you know, you've got the full backs going forward. But I just think that the four players up front, if you were three and then Lukaku, don't work hard enough defensively. So for the two open midfield players, they're, they're getting overrun. So I said prior to the Derby game, I'd like to say that he played three midfield players, Messi, to Barry and McCarthy. And to my surprise, he did do that. I thought it wasn't a great game, the Derby game, but I thought it looked more solid by all accounts last night. We defended really well. Uh, so I think he might have to change. You know, he's loath to change the way he wants to play. He wants to play on the left. Uh, he doesn't want to play back to front. I think David Moyes' team at times went back to front and then played in the final third. Uh, so I think he's looked at it and thought, you know, we're conceding too many goals. And I also think we've been beset by injuries. You know, there's a lot of players are injured, which hasn't helped. But I think he has to change his formation and change the two holding midfielders to three. Uh, he's got enough talent in there. He's at Gibson, who's not really featured much due to injury. McCarthy's coming back. Barry gets set off last night, so he misses the game. So I'd like to see that he goes with the three midfielders, Vestage, uh, McCarthy, and Gibson for the next few games, just to give us a little bit of solidity and move us off the table. I guess it's good to see Ross Barkley. Well, I mean, he's a when he's fit. A player, say, with his ambition um, and his talent, given where Everton is sitting at the table under Martinez, who hasn't, again, similar to that David Moyes perception, he's going to a bigger club, he's sort of battling a bit. If you were Ross Barkley, what would you be thinking? What would you I, think he's playing, for a I think he's trying to go straight at the minute because he's not playing particularly well at the minute, if I'm totally honest. Crowded, the fans, even though he's a lot of boys, 20 year old fans, they're getting onto his back a little bit. But Ross is playing in one of them positions just behind Lukaku that Stephen Naismith has been fantastic for us. He likes to play that role. So it's, he, and Samuel Eto'o has just left to go, he, he liked that role. So it's difficult for Ross and his form at the minute is not great, but I, I think t technically and ability wise, he's a fantastic player, he's a big strong boy. He's attacking, he picks the ball, and he makes things happen. But every player gets it throughout the season. Uh, some part of the career, the form, uh, they struggle for form a little bit. I just think Ross is struggling for his form. That's that's why he's left on the bench at the minute. But for me, Ross Barkley is the future of Everton. I don't want to. You don't want to sell Ross Barkley. We need players like him at Everton Football Club. So I'm hoping Ross will just find his form soon and even in the never saw him for the next ten years. When you had Tim Cahill available as well, he's just signed with Shanghai Shanghai, so you could have got him back in the chair. He would have been okay for six months, wouldn't you? Well, no, yeah, because at this point in time, when you're down the bottom of the league and in that area, you know, you're a little bit fearful. What Tim gave you was Tim gave you an aggression, a passion, you know, and the fans loved him for like 80 goals as well, don't get me wrong. But that sort of player is Tim. I'm not, I'm not too sure whether Tim is, he won't like me to say this, is maybe up, up to play in Premier League games week in, week out. Frustrate him as well. Yes, we'd love to come back, but it's that sort of player that we're, we're missing at the moment. I think, I think that's why Everton was successful. When I joined the club in '87, uh, they were a fantastic football team, Everton, and uh, Liverpool dominated not only English football but European football. But you looked at uh, Everton's team when I signed, and yet Neville Southall was probably the best keeper in the world at the time, that won he, he was so determined to win a football game. You've got Kevin Rapton. And then out of the back, that was so 
uh, strikers out. You've got Peter Reid in midfield who tackled, closed down from Sharpie up front, they won't let the defenders set up. So you could you could get it down, you could play football, you could win a football match by playing, but if you had to grind out the result as well in a determined fashion, then boys could do it. I just don't think we've got that many characters at the minute to fight and win a game of football if you need me. Don't get me wrong, McCarthy will and Jackie Elsa will, but I don't think we've got enough characters in the team to go out and actually grind the results out like we did in that day. So, it actually seems like a similar theme in some of the top teams. Though. Yeah. I mean, you see how the game has evolved. I mean, Arsenal, everyone's been saying that about Arsenal for about the last decade. Look at Manchester United now. Yeah, yeah fortunate to get that last gasp equaliser against West Ham from a long ball, but yeah, they struggle to grind it out. City are struggling. Chelsea can grind it out, but then they got criticised heavily for that hour draw against City. So the game is definitely changing. But I guess we'll widen it up to some questions from the audience in a minute. But I'll just fire, fire away a few quick questions. Best player you ever played with? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, I think you make the way to the top 100. Uh, probably about 99. Uh, probably, probably we weren't saying that last night after the drink. <laughs> Give him a bit. Yeah. I, would, I would probably say Ian mentioned the Neville Southall time was, was one of the last. It was, people talk about Peter Schmeichel at Manchester United. Neville was better than Peter Schmeichel. Uh, at his point, Neville, obviously they progressed and more way on and, you know, he fell away a little bit. But when he was successful in, in the, the 80s, Neville Southwell was one of the last. So he was the best player to play in that team as well. I was fortunate to play for Scotland and Douglas and, and Sunnis were in the team as well. They were great outfield players, but I have to say, the world class player I tend to agree with that. Um, it's like when, as I said when I signed for they had international stars. I didn't get an international cap uh, at first team level. So when, when the internationals were around that week, obviously Ratners went to Wales, found an out for some reason, but well I don't know how we got that one, but he went to Wales, the, the boys went to Scotland and England, and there probably only three of us left training that day. Uh, that week, uh, with me, Adrian, Ethan, Alan Arthur. Uh, so they were internationally fantastic players. But as Sharp said, I thought we had one world class person in that middle side. He was, he was fantastic. You always call him unique with Alfie, it's not like, there's something. The the man, the man, the the yeah. There's something very unique about him. Yeah, very unique. That's what they call it. Yeah, that's the one. So we talk about the best player, the worst player that you've ever seen there going on. I don't want to pass anymore. You didn't say that last time. I'm not passing him anymore. How, how is he in the team with me? Yeah. He's, he's rubbish. I, I am one player that's a great... Uh, I wouldn't say there's a worst player because he was a talented player. Uh, it was Peter Beagle. He was the most infuriating player in the world. And for me as a centre forward, uh, there was one that the crosses to come in early. That was a nightmare. Was, he would never cross it. And you'd make a run and he'd come out and make another run. But um, prior to that, uh, I lived in Southport, which was a lot of football. I was in Kenny Douglas called me one night, and uh, my wife answered the phone and she said, It's Kenny Douglas. And I thought, What does he want? He doesn't use it for me. So I go, Hi, Kenny, how are you doing? He says, All right, Charlie, I'm just uh, wishing you all the best for your operation. And I'm thinking, Operation? Good for an operation. I said, What are you on about, Kenny? He said, Oh, for an operation, good luck. I said, Kenny, I'm fine, I'm fine and fit. He said, You won't be in a couple of months, you'll just sign Peter B. And you'll be going into hospital for your calf, which is good. And then, 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 and horrendous. Yeah. It seriously was and I was captain of uh, Everton at the time when we signed him. So they used to put the new players on the course of a few away games to room with the new players. So I'd seen Brenton training and I watched him in this particular game and I thought this boy's going to struggle. Uh, he's, he's not the best. And I wanted to be polite to him and I'm rooming with him after about three weeks. His third day and he brings all the uh, from the estate agents, brings all the answers out that he'd been looking at and what to buy. And I just turned around and said, Brett, 
just read it. <laughs> Don't buy a mouse and sell it, just read it. And he replied, okay, so you weren't going to be there that long. And he went, to be honest, he was there about six months and we, we sold him on. And he, he would have sent forward, bought him for half a million pounds. And one night, Howard Kennedy came back as his sentence, kind of thing, to, to manage. And it was a night game, I swear this is true, it was a night game. And uh, the game was going on, and the next thing, Brett, he's on the floor, and he's looking like that, and Howard Kennedy turned around, and he went, what's he doing, the game's going on, what's he doing? He'd lost his contact lens, <laughs> right? He wore contact lens, I sent a ball, we played a million pounds, uh, not a million pounds, but, and he was looking for it on the pitch because he dropped out. So I would got rid of him within about two weeks. But uh, yeah, he weren't, he weren't the best player to play for anyone. Who's been the, the best ever player for you? You know, we have to go back to the history of Steve Dixie Dean. There was, was a way back in, in the 30s. And, and the yeah, the rate apart from him. Uh, apart from him, probably, and it was before my time, we had Alan Bob, who was a lovely field player, played in midfield, uh, played for England, won the World Cup final in 1966. Uh, he's revered by you know, the, the, the Everton fans, and talking to a lot of older fans who, who watched him play, they said he was special. Everton was special for him, but he, he, he was a fantastic player. That was a good team in the, in the 70s when they won the league. Uh, but the ball was, was exceptional. You know, Colin Harvey, how he came to have the ball. Uh, famous, famous, famous midfield players. But I think Bolly just tips it. So for me, Alan Ball. Yeah, well, I didn't really see Alan Ball at, at Everton, but when you sign for Everton, you, you try and get to know the history of the club straight away. And uh, Kendall, Paul and Harvey, you just straight away people say it was the old Trinity and there's a big sign of them now for at least in the three of them in the playing days. So you get to know the history really, really well. You get to know about Dixie Dean and how everybody performed, etc. But Kendall, Paul and Harvey, yeah, everybody in the years then talks about them. And uh, yeah, they must have been a special place. And final question before we open up to everyone. Best player in the world. I think Sharp is reading his book. He's just bought, he's just bought it from the airport. Didn't he? Ball, uh, from Phuket. He, he said, "I've got my little uh, little reading book, and it's messy for me." He's, he's bought his uh, he's bought a bit of biography, and uh, for me, I know Ronaldo and Messi are unbelievable players, but for me, Messi. Yeah. It's those two, and it's it's a hard hard choice. And I think. Yeah, yeah, Ronaldo for me has got everything. You know, scored goal with his head and right foot, left foot. You know, but Messi is something else. Messi reminds me of Maradona when he picks a ball. It hasn't been the best this season last year. Okay, he's got a lot of goals, but hasn't really produced it for his country. You know, he hasn't really gone in there. Maradona, when you pick it, he keeps dragging Napoli to the Serie A title, dragged Argentina to World Cup. Messi hasn't really gone there yet, you know, but as I say, between the two of them, Ronaldo Messi, yeah, I just shared it Messi. Guys, has anyone got any questions? Sure, there's a few. How did I know you were going to be the first to get that done? Who was the best defender you ever played against? Best defender? Again, it wasn't Snods, although... It's it's been, it's been, no, it's well, like, I know you're on the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. This league to me was he marked me once when Don Castle came to the top. So it wasn't him. In fact, Mark Gray. But uh, basically, the one who always, who I could never get the better of was David O'Leary when he was at Arsenal. Uh, playing a high break at the time, it was a really, really tight pitch. And Arsenal were really, really difficult to beat. Uh, but David O'Leary was was relatively quick, he was tall, he could compete there, uh, a bit of long legs, so he thought he could pass and make a tackle. So I always struggled, you know, against the league. He was probably my toughest opponent, you know, Hanson, Morrison were, were great players, but they didn't like the physicality of you know, going up against them uh, for headless and able battles, but for me it was David O'Leary. Yeah, I think when, as a midfield player, when I first arrived at him, I thought Brian Robson was everything. Tackle, he could score goals, he could defend. He was a fantastic player, great leader. So Brian Robson I found really hard to play against uh, when we played.
play Man United, but then when I went to full back, right full back, to be honest, I had a little bit of pace, so I never really had trouble with people with pace, because I had a little bit of pace. Obviously, a big difference now, but I wait. But I think for ability wise, John Barnes, I found, was the hardest player to play against. He would be a fantastic ability. Uh, just the drop of his shoulder. And when, I, when I first went to right back, Trevor Stephen, who was a fantastic player for Everton, played in front of me. And defensively, he trapped back and he worked hard. And for two games I played against John Barnes, I thought, what's all the trouble about? There's nothing. He hardly had a kick because Trevor was doing so well defensively. And Trevor left, and we signed Pat Nevy. Pat Nevin was just a, an attacking he didn't know how to defend whatsoever. So when Pat came, the first, one of the first games we played Liverpool at Anfield, and John Barnes came at me about 24 times in the first 10 minutes. And I thought, oh my God, this boy's a <laughs> <laughs> And he did, he, he destroyed me for about 45 minutes. He were, were fantastic. So yeah, John Barnes for me as a winger, Brian Robson as a midfield player. Any other questions? Yeah. It's a question for both of you, it's on the same thing. A question each for you. Great. Have ever tell me stop buying your drinks yet for the game in Anfield? And Ian, same question, have we stopped buying your drinks yet for Ted and Red Uh the answer is no. And it's quite surreal at times. Can I can I just interrupt? Oh, really <laughs> Somebody asked him about this goal out there, and he gets a yard further back yeah. every time he has it. He scored from the halfway line. Yeah. It's an Anfield, that was yeah. an No, they do, and it's, it's crazy at times, and then uh, in town, I'll be out for, for dinner with my wife, and you, you get this feeling that somebody's watching you when you're eating, and you're thinking, what's going on here? And I was in town one, one, uh, one evening, and this woman got up, and she came over to the table, and I'm thinking, oh, oh. This could spell trouble with this walk from taking hopes when my wife has something hopes. So she comes over and she says, uh, I hope you don't mind, but would you mind going over to that table where my husband is sitting and just say hello because all I've seen for the last 45 minutes is your goal on video on this board. I mean, I want to have a nice meal with my, my husband. So I had to go to the table and say, Listen, how are you doing? How are you? Fantastic shot. Do you remember that goal? Remember that goal? So that happens all the time. And the, the good of it is, I usually say go and drink as well. So I'm still, I'm still drinking and hanging out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Paul ever told me. He was over in 87. I had an opportunity to sign for either Everton or Liverpool. I played for Leeds United then. We've got Leeds United on in there. And uh, that's, that's <laughs> great, <laughs> had some great times there. But uh, yeah, both Everton and Liverpool came in to sign me in 87, which was incredible because as I said before, there were two top clubs not only in English but over in Europe at the time. And to be wanted by them we both put an offer in and it was my decision. I went and talked to Kenny Daglis then the manager of Liverpool and I went to talk to Howard Kendall the same day. I had to give him a decision the next day. And uh, fortunately for me to this day uh, I chose Everton Football Club and I would, if I had that option again it would be exactly the same again. It's an incredible all the people's club and they made me feel the last made me feel welcome as soon as uh, as soon as I signed that day. Uh, but it is a little bit frustrating when I go to tonight's with the former Everton players and they go through the international caps of Neville Southall and the team and then Sharp who scored 150 goals, 180 goals, whatever. And then they come to me and just say, he turned the red shark down. <laughs> that's how they say it, that's how they introduced me. He is still going to play us, he turned the Liverpool down. So. But no, it was, uh, it was an odd choice, but the best choice I ever made. But I never used to drink either before I came to Everton Football Club. So thanks, Sharpie. I'm now in our college. Uh, thanks to the boys, uh, they got me drinking socially as well because they were a successful team. I uh, won the league championship that year, I signed. So it was fantastic. Liverpool finished with us at Everton won it, so I just managed to get the championship made. Uh, but it isn't only that, it's where you're happy. It's where you're happy. All right, you love to win things as a footballer. But if you're happy at a football club, I think your family's happy, you're happy. And uh, that's why I keep relating back to China. The relationship between China and Everton, we're happy, Everton are happy, the, 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 the mutual feeling between us. And I think in any walk of life, if you're happy, 
uh, everything around me is up here, and I was up here today, so I'm forever thoughtful, and I still am to this day. Thank you. Very nice. One more question. Thanks. Um, for a start, I'm a Coventry City supporter. And... Oh, you're the one, eh? Yeah. <laughs> There are three of us oh, in that sorry, room, actually. Um, secondly, I was um, in charge of school football in Coventry for 20 years, just about. Um, one of the things that interests me, I, I agree with what you said, Ian, about the, the way we mould youngsters to be um, premiership players. Um, 999 out of 1,000, probably more than that, are going to fall through that sieve and never make it and be yeah. totally and utterly disappointed. Um, I'd love to know how you got into the game, both of you, and what you think needs to be done for the 999 who are never going to get there. Well, the, the second part of us, I would say, what, what they do for, for the kids, and I agree with you, and I think they start, everyone's got a group of, of children at four years of age, now, if you can tell me a footballer at four, that's crazy. And that's how they, they get them together and, and they teach them all their balance and, and movement and everything else. And I think that's far, far too young. But for all the ones that drop down, you know, we like to think that the academy system and how they've been taught, you know, not just on the field, but off the field as well, in terms of dealing with education, we make sure that their education doesn't suffer. And what we usually find is the boys who drop out, will go elsewhere and, and make a living in football. You know, not everyone, so I can understand that, but we do try our best to make sure that the kids, when they leave Everton Football Club, if they're not getting taken on, that academically, they're, they're right. And if they fall behind with their, their, their work and their, their project work and their homework, they don't get selected, you know, for the team. So we do look after them, we try and help them. Uh, I started playing when I was seven, it was my first competitive game. I played in an under 11 game at school. Uh, it was all I wanted to do uh, in Glasgow. Uh, my, my older brother signed for Rangers uh, yeah. uh, and played a couple of games there. But you know, I, I stayed on at school and took all my exams. I saw my exams. It was only when I was 17 that I was picked up with the semi uh, pro team, Dumbarton. Uh, before that, we talked to the grassroots. Scotland had a very strong amateur league from under 11 all the way up to under 18. They take the place of what the academy is now. They had a very strong league, so a lot of our boys were signing for clubs. I had opportunities to sign for Villa, uh, but eventually signed for Everton. But it was all I wanted to do. And whilst my friends would do different things and go out on a Friday, not for me because I just wanted to play football. I was fortunate enough along the way that I got the, the luck that I needed at times, uh, so it could easily have went wrong for me. But I'd like to think that due to the hard work that I put in when I was a youngster, you know, training two nights a week, uh, that helped me uh, to go forward in football. And I was lucky that the clubs I chose were the right clubs for me. My father, uh, Rangers wanted to sign me, but because my father said that it would have been an opportunity at a smaller club, I went there and then the rest, as I say, is history of Cyber Everton and it kicked on. So it was always something I wanted to do. I think I went for one job interview uh, and it was in a bank and I wasn't too disappointed that I never got it. So, so that was me. Yeah, myself, uh, I've got a brother, Clay, who's, who's been involved in the football as well. Again, again played for Leeds United. Uh, I played for Sheffield Wednesday, the Gamblers and Rovers. And he was three years older than me, Glenn, and I always wanted to compete against him as a youngster, be better than him. And to this day, I always tell him I were better than him. He's uh, now assistant manager at Preston, which I am Grayson. Uh, he's had a successful career himself. So I, I always had something to aim for in life to be better than my brother. And uh, I, he was at Doncaster, Doncaster Rovers, as a, as a young boy, got on the team at 17. So he took me uh, schoolboy football uh, for Doncaster, I played with the schoolboys there. He just said, can my brother come in in the school holidays? And, and I trained with the, with the youngsters at, at Doncaster. And I was quite fortunate, I had a, a famous man who was no longer with us, the late great Billy Brevner. Oh, yeah. He signed me at 16 year old. And I just think, 
for myself personally, I can't thank him enough. He was absolutely a dream for me. Looked after me at 16 year old, gave me my debut. 18 year old, he made me captain of Doncaster. So I always, I idolised him, I really did. And I just think if it wasn't for him, yeah, I might have, I might have gone elsewhere. And I might have not performed as well. So from a personal point of view, I owe everything to him. Uh, and I did a top of sound for that, as I say, at Leeds United. Uh, had a reasonable, successful career. Uh, and as Sharpie said, you've got to have a bit of luck. You have got to have a bit of luck in life, and in football, I had a bit of luck. But I also like to think that I've worked hard as well. Uh, and, and now, coming round, round to Thailand, where I think Greg Stewart, another ambassador of the club, is going out to Dallas next week. He went uh, to India. And it's great that we've still got this opportunity to spread the word and spread the word football because it is worldwide football. It's fantastic to be involved in still to this day and long may it continue as well. It's brought some great time. It's brought some hard time, some difficult times when your phone's not wrong. Hands are getting in your safe, but the good times outweigh the bad times. And um, it's a fantastic life. And I think it's, it's such an important aspect of the relationship between Chang and Everton that for every player that does play in the Premier League that becomes a superstar, there's thousands and thousands that don't. But I think we all appreciate that success doesn't mean playing in the Premiership. We all appreciate what sport and, and football particularly for, for young kids brings, the camaraderie, the teamwork, the sense of winning and losing, um, the competitive nature of it is, is all those things. And it's brilliant to have the relationship that Everton and Chang do. So Chang, thank you very much for bringing the Bringing the guys here, ladies and gentlemen, please you. Thank you. A very big round of applause. And before I, before I go away, I'll take the table off again. And a big thanks to Pete and Roberts yes. for stepping in. Fantastic. Uh, I'm told the Everton Supporters Club in Thailand are here, not all of them, I trust. Uh, but they would like to make a presentation to, to, to Graham and Ian. Um, I think. The thing that Graham and Ian would most like at the moment, is a beer. I think, uh, is a beer. <laughs> but uh, Everton Supporters Club, would you like to come forward and make your presentation?